Hello and welcome to another episode of the Just Talking About Films podcast, where we just talk about films. Um, in a few moments, we'll talk about films that we've been watching, and then we'll come to a topic that we discuss together. Um, and I think this week we've tried to take on the impossible. When we were chatting about it, and Luke suggested, I thought, what a great idea. And <laughs> as we got on with it, it's, it's proven really difficult. So um, we'll get on to that soon. My name is Ian Sargentson. And my name is Luke Taylor. And yes, this week's topic may have been hubris. <laughs> of all the ones <laughs> to start on, we've we are ranking things that I think it might be impossible to rank. <laughs> um, but we will get to that in a moment. First of all, though, uh, do you want to go first, Ian? What have you been watching this week? Yeah, so um I've watched a few films this week. As I said last time, I've just found more time in an evening now after my wife and son go to bed, I get my time. So I've got a few this week. Um, so the first one I watched that um, after we spoke last time was Home Team, Home which team. was I just I just wanted something light. Um, it was on. Um, I think it's Netflix. Is it on? Yeah, I think it's Netflix. Home Team. It's Kevin. Kevin James. Is that the guy oh, I mean? Yeah. Um, Paul Blatt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know the one you mean, yeah. So it's Kevin James, and he's... Um, and it's based on a true story loosely, I think, although it's quite contested when you look online, um, about a, an NFL coach that gets suspended for a year by because his team or his team of coaches um, set out and, and rewarded their players for injuring op- opposition players. So he got banned for a, a year, and during his suspension, he went um, to see his son who lived across the other side of the country and ended up coaching their team. Um, and learning some lessons, which is it's all nice and it looked good from the trailer to a degree. Sounded like a nice feel good story, but just as a credit roll, it said a Billy Madison production. <laughs> I was a bit worried because as much as some films um, are good, there's just always an element of silliness that, or usually always an element of silliness that I just can't really get it beyond. Um, and it was the same story of this. It would have been a good film if they just did away with some of the nonsensical silliness. And um, and then um, Rob Schneider's in it. And I don't mind Rob Schneider, but when he's in a film, particularly with an Adam Sandler film, the, you know the character's just going to be ridiculous. Yeah. So it was let down badly by that for me. The story was all right, um, but it was just let down by silliness. So, yeah, I didn't overly enjoy it i think i gave it two out of five um and then after that i watched seven because for our film club we were due to watch seven so i watched that and we discussed that it was and it was quite interesting to see the range of views on it how highly people rated it and as a piece of filmmaking i rated really high and Mm. i know some people had different views because the ending wasn't satisfying because it wasn't all tied up nicely in a happy ending yeah which i Sorry. Sorry. But for me, it gave it it gave it more. That's why I gave it more because it didn't it didn't go down a cliched route, even though what I wanted was it for a a happy ending. Yeah. But what I got was something I'll remember forever, something I'll talk about, and a reminder that I guess life's not always about happy endings. It's not. I mean, some people rated it low because it made them feel bad. Yeah. But hey, it made them feel. I'd rather yeah, yeah. the film made me feel bad than make me feel nothing. And it meant yeah. to make you feel bad. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I said. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic piece of filmmaking still mm. all this time later, but it was one of the things where I was like, if you'd have stopped it 10 minutes before the end or 20 minutes, all of the, well, 15, 15 to 20 minutes before the end, every time I watch it and say, what do you want to happen? I will tell you, I want the cliche. I want everything to be tied up nicely. And everyone to go away, live and have it happily, happily ever after. But I think if we did that, even though that's what I want, the film loses something about what it is. It does, I think yeah. it is so popular because of that that element of it. So I love that. Um, really, really good film. Then I watched, it's one of the things, it's in my mind. I don't know if you ever get this, where you think, oh, I really like this film and I want to watch it. And I wanted to watch Sea Biscuit. So I watched Sea oh, really? Biscuit. Um, and I did it another time, I think, a couple of years ago. So I must have watched the film three times. But I really want to watch Sea Biscuit. this feel-good film. And, and it wasn't the film. It was so. It was another film I was thinking of. And I did it twice now. So Sea Biscuit was fine. It was good. But the film that I really wanted to watch was 
Secretariat. Oh, right, okay. So the both Different true horse stories form. about hot race horses, and <laughs> but the Secretariat just has a bit more heart for me, a bit more body, and it's a bit less angsty. Um, so I watched Sea Biscuit. I enjoyed it enough, but then when I realised that it wasn't what I wanted to watch, I then watched Secretariat after that <laughs> and enjoyed that immensely. Um, it's nice to compare them. Which so the Secretariat's yeah. a better, much better film. Well, I don't know. I think probably Sea Biscuit's probably a better made film to some degree. Might it's less because Secretariat is Disney, mm. so it does that Disney thing where it's all about focusing on the positives. Where Sea Biscuit's a bit more. You know, with um, what's he called? Spider Man. Tobey Maguire. Yeah. Yeah, Tobey Maguire. His character is conflicted, and there's and they're all, they're all well, all the main characters have got a story of heartbreak, really, and the horse kind of brings them together. So there's that element of it. Whereas Secretariat is much more of a feel good that I was looking for, which is nice all the way through, and um, and I like it slightly more. But I say I made the same thing mistake last time when I oh I really want to watch Sea Biscuit and then after it I watch Secretary but it is good because it means as you say I end up watching both so yeah. and they're both good films and it just makes me think I want a racehorse but I don't <laughs> it's just this and then last night I watched Captain Marvel because what I'm trying to do is go through all of the Marvel films as you know I'm not that much of so you're doing them in chronological order yeah so I'm not that, that much of an enthusiast but I wanted to watched them all and ranked them really just for something to do on Letterboxd. Um, so that was the second one apparently in the list after um, Captain America. Hmm. And after two minutes, well, I started watching it on Thursday, I think, or Tuesday or something. And after two minutes, I stopped there for this. Oh. It and starts thought, oh, very confusing, back. that film, doesn't it? Yeah, I thought I'll have to get back to it and start it again. And I watched it and I didn't know what was going on. I thought this is boring, CGI everywhere. It was more like a computer game. And I thought, oh... This is horrendous. I can't wait to write my review about how horrendous this is. I'll tolerate it just so I can do that. And then as the story unraveled and unfolded, it got better. So I didn't overly like the character of um, Carol Danvers. Carol Danvers. She was a bit a bit too, I don't know, jokey and oh, look how funny I am for me. Initially, but I know, I know that's a bit of Marvel. But as it went on, I, I found it a bit better, a bit easier. The twist that came, I didn't see that coming. I like that. Um, I like the evolution of Fury, Nick mm. Fury, and finding that and finding, you know, the origin of the Avengers, really. So, so ultimately, yeah, I didn't hate it, but it started off poor, whereas I thought Captain America started well and went poor. I thought mm. this started poor and got better. So. So yeah, they're, they're the things I've been I've been watching. So that was Home Team on Netflix, Seven on some streaming things, Sea Biscuit on DVD, Secretariat was Disney, as was Captain Marvel. Excellent, excellent. I, I enjoyed Captain Marvel. It was you know it was okay. It's one of those ones you get to the end of fills in some blanks, but it's not it's not going to change the world kind of film. No, I mean it got better as I say, mm. and I say I like the bit where it shows you how the Avengers got the name and. Even the Marvel thing, and yeah, I like that. A bit of nineties nostalgia is always fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I only managed three films this week. Um, I have been caught up with some TV series instead. <laughs> um, but um, first one was the Tender Bar. Um, on your recommendation yeah. from was it last week you recommended that? A week before, before, I think. Yeah. Um, which um. George Clooney directing, uh, Ben Affleck as the uh, as a bar owner, and it's about the family and the son. And yeah, I think it was one of those films where I found it enjoyable. Um, it's quite slight, you know. Yeah. Um, some some nothing against George Clooney, but he's not the greatest director. He's okay, you know. But um, I think in a different pair of hands, I'd probably would have you know had a tear shed maybe towards the end, but it didn't hit me as emotionally as it could have done. Um, and it's one of those films where it suffers a little bit in that the child actor is far better than the, uh, yeah, the actor yeah. playing him as a young adult. Yeah. So when it develops through the story, you kind of miss the child actor. <laughs> you're like, yeah, that's what oh, I said. Yeah. I said it was great up until that point, and when he got, gets older, it just fell away for a bit for me. 
It did. It just loses its impact because whilst the guy's fat, it's, it's it's seeing the character as a child, which has much more impact. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know what you can really do about that. You can't tell a story of somebody's journey into journalism and writing without having that bit, I guess. And it needed a conclusion where he, you know, he, even the reconnection with his dad in a sense. But yeah, I, I enjoyed the start of it, but I, it lost me towards the end, I think. Um, yeah, you know, it was a fine way to spend the time. I, I, I'm struggling to remember details of it now, um, which is never a good sign. I mean, yeah, it was just as it got to a young, even like it's like, oh, this um, coming of age story and it's his relationship with that girl. It was just, that was just plain weird. Yeah, he was a bit upset. It's like, dude, take a hint. <laughs> yeah, know? and then even she was weird. And when he met, meets the parents, it was all just what? what? Yeah, yeah, I didn't get that. She certainly didn't come off as likable. And because it's a real, a true story. She's a real person, you think. Yeah, yeah. It, she's not painted in a very good light in this film at all. Um, I hope she's okay with the film. <laughs> and the book, I guess it's based on. Anyway, that's, yeah. Yeah, he, he, I mean, guys do get a little bit obsessed with, you know, with girls at some point, you know, and, and when you get, when you know, when they get the hooks in you. <laughs> but <laughs> um, he goes a bit far. He, 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 uh, he doesn't come off in the best light. He, he kind of looking at going, you know, you need to move on. Yeah, his friends are all telling him, aren't they? So yeah. Well, I thought Ben Affleck did well in the film. Thought he played a good part. I mean, it mm. wasn't. It was hard to stretch him, but I thought he gave some um, a focal point and some heart to it. Yeah, Christopher Lloyd was good too. He was fun, you know, as the uh, yeah, yeah, as yeah. the grumpy one, but has that you know those moments of tenderness in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that so. was good. Where he took him to the dinner. Yeah, yeah, that was that was great. I love that bit. Love that bit. Um, so that was the tender bar that is available on Prime. I think is that right? Yeah, I think, I that think was so. Prime. And then I um, rewatched for the second. I only saw it once at the cinema. Uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife. Okay. And that's just come out. Sky uh, gave me a free um, purchase, so I bought Ghostbusters Afterlife with it. Um, and second time round. I've got to say, I didn't enjoy it as much. It didn't hold up for me quite as much. I enjoyed it fine the first time, but um, the problems for it are more noticeable second time round. Hmm. Um, or maybe I just noticed them first time round. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I, was mean, what, less, I was less enthusiastic than you, were. you and Connie, you weren't I? So yeah. I like, yeah, he rated it one of his highest of the year. Um, I, yeah. I, looking at it now, I'm a bit... It, it is a nostalgia kick, and that's always enjoyable. But I think it's hard to play nostalgia and play laughs at the same time. And I don't think it was enough of a comedy. It wasn't funny enough. A Ghostbusters film should be funny. That's mm. that's what Ghostbusters is. It's a comedy. And no, it, to me, it wasn't. It didn't play as a comedy at all. It was so busy kicking the nostalgia thing and the whole Harold Ramis thing that it wasn't funny enough. Um, yeah. And it had too many references to the old films in. Um, one that really stood out for me was the yes, yeah, Dave Puff Marshmallow Man. You know, the little Marshmallow Man. Yeah, yeah. And I was looking at it thinking, this makes no sense. This is only there for fans of the first film. It doesn't make sense in context of what's going on with Goza or anything like that. Well, it doesn't, because in the original, the giant Marshmallow Man was possessed by a... It was Goza. Yeah, it was Goza, yeah. yeah. So but these oh, how would you get all these mini marshmallows? Do you know what I mean? No, it, it doesn't. And I was looking at, it, at that scene and thinking, this whole scene would have played much better with Paul Rudd. He hears a scream and he goes to investigate. Then he comes across the marshmallow and then he finds the terror dog. The scene yeah. would have played much better if he just heard the scream and found the terror dog. Yeah. It, would have, it would have made much more sense. Um, and so stuff like that... It, it doesn't work um and then it, it, it miss it one thing that's great about the first ghostbusters film is nobody read you know they're the, the sort of building the business up but that when they finally take on goza at the end it's public yeah and they've got new york turning out shouting ghostbusters ghost you know all of that stuff is great and same with ghostbusters too it happens in public this it should have happened somewhere other than the farm it should have been in public. It should have. We should have seen the small town overrun with ghosts. We get a glimpse of that. Not enough. Like you know, you want to, you want to see the chaos, and then you want to see them 
win in public and the, the end just feels hollow because you don't get that it takes you know nobody has a clue what's gone on by the end of the day and um, so it didn't have that that moment at the end that, that I feel like it should have had um, so yeah it was okay I enjoyed it but certainly it's gone down a bit um, so that's Ghostbusters Afterlife. And then, based on another recommendation of you, um, I watched another round. Oh, another round, yeah. Um, which I really enjoyed. Really, really yeah, enjoyed. Good, wasn't it? Um, it's a strange film. It, it got me at the start going, you know, when there's the discussion that every, everyone's born with 0.5% yeah. alcohol deficiency and to be on premium level, you need to top that up. And I spent the first half of the film going, is that true? Yeah, I did. It can't Thinking. be. Thinking, should I try that? <laughs> Not seriously, but you know what I mean? Because yeah. without, because it, 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 it's interesting because there's always a recognition, oh, no, always, but for me, there's a recognition that I don't know the complexities of alcohol, but mm. if, if you have a drink and there's that, you notice a difference, but it's a good difference. Mm. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's a buzz, you can tell that alcohol's having an effect on you or whatever. And then I think that's, I guess that's what it's talking about. But then beyond that, it just gets more destructive or more yeah. warps your sense of thing more. And it shows that well in the film. But yeah, the first I was like, is this true? Is this a real theory? And I, and I Googled around <laughs> it at the end. So Is it true? Is it, if you, I, never I don't know if it's it. true, but there's a guy that has a theory, yeah. Oh, okay. So the theory really exists because I couldn't work out. But, yeah. But for me, and, and obviously, is it based on a true story then? Or is it just based on the theory? Yeah, I think so. It's fascinating. For me, uh, it's a frustration when you're watching it because they start operating and it starts having an effect on them that he starts being a better teacher at school and yeah. they all start doing their jobs better and you think, okay, that's interesting, that's interesting. But then they up the level too quickly. Yeah. And you're like, that guy with the beard, it's all his fault. All his yeah. fault. He's the one who suggests taking it too far. If they'd have stayed at the level, I'm fascinated to know if they'd stayed at the level that they are, whether they would have had a better job. <laughs> Well, I think that's part of what it's doing. I think it was challenging the drinking culture in Denmark and other countries, mm. you know, where the age is 16. Yeah. Like, as the teacher was saying, you, we know you do this and you all do that run they're talking about at the beginning and we know yeah. we have to drink. So it's that, and it's a culture. And the kid, how many do you, much do you drink? And he's like, oh. So, but yeah, but as much as it was about that, for me, I love the element of the friendship mm -hmm. aspect of it because they were a close knit group and you'd see that all had the struggles particularly Madge Mickelson's character. Yeah. Um, so I'll, as much as it was about the experiment, there was that lens into their life as well. And Mads Mickelson was brilliant. Um, oh, he was outstanding. Yeah. You're so used to him playing the bad guy. Yeah. That we don't appreciate outside of, of, um, of Denmark, I guess, how good an actor he is. And he plays this, this guy who's just numb to life so well. And sad, there's a, such a he's got captures his sadness so well. Yeah, he does. Yeah, very. <clears throat> You're really warm to him, don't you? Yeah, yeah, um, I, yeah. He, you just you feel for him, yeah, and and um, you you want to see him succeed. When he starts stepping out and being good at his job, you you're rooting for him the whole time. Yeah, especially um, when there's been the intervention, and when he gets the text at the end, I was like punching the air, mate. I was like, yes. Yeah. You know yeah. What I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, so very good film. That was on Sky and, uh, yeah, really enjoyed that. It uh, takes that level. It's not one to watch with your phone in your hand because it's subtitled. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, very good film. And you'll have to watch the other one I watch with him. Um, I can't remember what it's called now. Riders of Justice. You'll have Riders to watch that. Justice. Well, so you think of that. That's Martin Mickelson as well. He plays a slightly different character now, more complex character in some ways. I'm so, going to add that to my watch list. Excellent. But yeah, good good film, worth watching. And it's an interesting discussion. It really is an interesting discussion. Um, and it doesn't glorify the use of alcohol at all. No, the opposite, I think. It mm. shows you the point where it becomes counterproductive, it becomes destructive, it becomes addictive, um, you know, because you see some of them struggling with the addiction mm -hmm. aspects, some of it struggling with their life. I mean, there's funny bits in it, or bits that are humorous, Situational wise, but mm. not humorous in real life. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, so I think it, it tackles the issue really well. Um, so I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah it's very good. It was very good. 
so that's all I've seen this week. I've got a few cinema uh, visits booked over the next few days, so I should have more in the week coming up. Uh, off to see Uncharted tonight. I've heard yeah, yeah, I was mixed thinking reviews about that. On that one. I might try and get to see that over the next few days. I, I don't mind the look of it. I mean, I played the games, and there's not many crossover well from games to hmm. um, film, especially when they're like this big adventure games. I mean, some people think series are better, like Witch, The Witcher and different things. But um, on chat, I'm worried about. I think Tom Holland's a great casting. Um, I think he, yeah, he fits that well. Um, it's got Mark Wahlberg in, so you know it can only be quality. So, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll uh, we'll catch up on that one sometime soon. Great. Okay, so let's move on to our topic for the week, which we decided to do the impossible. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was Luke, we suggest these topics and we sent put things around. And usually, what happens is the first one to suggest something, the other one goes, "Yeah, that sounds great," because <laughs> um, it takes the responsibility off the other one to think about it. And then Luke suggested this. I thought, "Oh, yeah, that'll be good. Have a great discussion." You know, I mean, there's plenty of stuff there. And then I just found it almost an impossible task. So Luke. Do you want to tell the people what you asked us to do? Yes. We thought, let's rank our favourite Steven Spielberg films. Let's see if we can create a top 10 Steven Spielberg films. And uh, dear me, it was a hard job. It really was because there's so many. I'm sad there's so many good films that didn't make the top 10. Yeah, I mean, the man's a genius. Um, And then it was a case of, what we've done is we've put our list together, which even just before we started recording here, I was wrestling with and, um, you know, perusing and considering. But um, so we put them in in an order and then they got points based on what position they were. And then we've got a conclusive order. Is that right, Luke? Yes. Which we do. you we know have. what it is. And I don't. I don't know what the result is. Um, and there's some films that we'll give them, we'll give an honourable mention. So, uh, maybe we won't do them first because it might spoil the ones that are in the top ten. But there's yeah. some films that deserve an honourable mention afterwards. Um, there's so many, so there many. There is, there is. I'm looking, I'm looking at the ones now that didn't make the top ten, and that makes me feel sad they're not there. <laughs> well, I had a list of fifteen, and there's some on there that weren't, and there's others that are probably lower down. It depends because I, it's like, um, does that measuring that quality of the filmmaking versus how much I enjoyed it. So some of the films I enjoyed more uh, higher up the list, probably than some films that are better made, but that's the criteria I went with. What is my best? Yes. Um, so I had 15, but we'll narrow it down to 10, but <laughs> my best Steven Spielberg films. Yes. And before we do that, um, I guess... What does Steven Spielberg mean to you in terms of his films? I mean, for me, he was the first director I ever knew about, even younger. Yeah. I hadn't heard of any other director, but I'd heard of Steven Spielberg. Yeah, I mean, I think I knew his name before I even knew what a director was or what a did, because it was, mm. you know, the, the age we were growing up, it was always like a new Steven Spielberg film, and he was in and around so many of the good films at the time. And... Um, yeah, and he had a funny name, you know, from a young kid from Teesside, so it kind of stuck in my mind, and it would be there. And uh, yeah, and I say he was associated with some some of my favourite films from my childhood. So mm. yeah, he was the first director I knew. First, yeah, name that if you'd have said to me at I don't know seven eight years old, can you name a film director? It'd be the only one I'd be able to name. Um, yeah, and he he was involved in so much, even as producer. Oh, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah. Um, that that uh, iconic. I mean, behind you, we got Back to the Future. That's you know. Hey, maybe we should do the top films he produced but didn't direct. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, he was involved in the Goonies as well somewhere. Right? Yeah, he produced the Goonies and uh, mm-hmm. Poltergeist. So many films that were just just you know, all over what we we were watching as a kid. Yeah, and one thing I do like, and I said it before. I think I said it when when we talked about one of his um, when I talked about one of his films before is that. One film in particular, no, no, maybe you know, there's a few of them actually. Now I'm thinking of it. What he creates, and I don't know how he does it, I can't put my finger on what it is, and a lot of his films is that rather than just observing through my eyes what is going on, it's almost like I'm placed there. Mm. And I can feel what's going on. 
I can smell what's going on. I can, it's just, I don't know what he does that catches it, but I feel it all. Um, it's like I'm placed in it rather than I'm watching it from outside. It's like I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I mean, nobody is, I mean, and, and, and consistent throughout the years as well. He's, um, you know, some directors you get ups and downs, but it, that's why what made this so hard is you look at the films he's done and there's not many that I'm not keen on. Not many at all. Yeah. And there's so many, such a variety now. So for me, there's one particular area that I find just, just looking at that there's real strength that he does. Um, but, you know, you've got sci-fi in there, you've got historic things, you've mm-hmm. got, um, you know, almost like horror kind mm-hmm. of things. There's and even now music to see. There is, yeah, there's just so many different things in there. Yeah. So good. So good. So we'll start with the top 10 and then we'll pick some films that didn't make it that we just want to highlight. Um, and okay. so we'll pick, we'll pick, we'll, um, we'll do the film and then we'll explain each of us what it is we like about that film. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, so at number 10, we have, I won't do that again. <laughs> um, okay. We, <laughs> we will have Munich. 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 Yeah. So what did you like about Munich, Luke? What I liked about Munich is it it was one of those films where you feel like you've been through the ringer by the end of it. Mm. It's one of those films that the, the subject matter is not glamorous. You know, it's the um, it's Mossad getting revenge for the yes, the um, the assassination of the uh, Israeli Olympic team at Munich. Mm-hmm. And it's it's one of those films where it's it's revenge, but by the end of the film, you feel like revenge isn't worth it. Mm. Um, and it really puts you through the ringer. And no, I think nobody comes out with that film clean or looking good. And the comp, and you like, it's it's makes you struggle to think because you're following uh, Eric Barner's guy, but at the same time you're like, this isn't right. What's going on here? You know. Mm. Uh, and I just love that it just puts that how it <sighs> revenge doesn't lead anywhere, and revenge just leads to things getting worse and it's uh, it's a fascinating film it's a hard film to watch and um you know it just pulls you in emotionally i think it's a great film great film yeah it's one of the things that as i say it for me it that he does very well is when it's based on a true story or real events it's difficult because you'll always come under increased scrutiny really hmm. um but the tension that is held in there, and as you say, it's easy to make these things depending on your leanings or your frame of reference quite black and white, quite you know, this is right, that's wrong. They and there's none of that, it's just murky, mm-hmm. um, from start to finish. As you say, there's you don't empathize well, you empathize with everyone and no one all at the same time, I think. Yeah, um, so yeah, I just think it captures that very well. Um, and as you say, it's more of an emotive experience mm-hmm. rather than an, an entertainment thing or an enjoyable thing. Yeah, it is. It's, it, it, the message of it to me is violence gets you nowhere. Yeah. And uh, it's good, good message. Okay, number nine, Empire of the Sun. Empire of the Sun. Hmm. So what I didn't, that? I didn't, uh, it didn't make my 15. And I didn't mind it, but I haven't seen it for a long time. I know that mm. I enjoyed aspects of it, but I can't really tell you what. So mm. this might be all on you. <laughs> oh, Empire of the Sun is one of those films where I remember seeing it very young. I remember watching it with my mum over in New Year's on a New Year's Day, I think, but a long, long time ago. And uh, it just struck me uh, because it's a child's view of World War II. And I, 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 I think I was younger than him at the time, a, a Christian Bale. As, um, yeah. And it's yeah. a true story. But I've never understood, even little things like uh, how it must have felt going through that, some of that stuff, the, concentra- the, the concentration camp stuff. And it just, it's a kid trying to get back to his parents. And, yeah. you know, I really, as a kid, I just remember I really, just really related to it and felt for him. And, but I think it just... It, it, it takes the horrors of war from the view of someone who's almost observing it, but going through it at the same time. And 
I think, yeah. you know, the life in the concentration camp and how, you know, society still exists in there. And um, even that, even in that, the Japanese aren't the bad guys. And he makes friends with this Japanese kid at the other side of the, at the other side of the fence. And, you know, I, I found it just such a fascinating look at war from this, from a, a, a normal person's point of view. Yeah. I mean, it is about it's a Japanese invasion of China in World yeah. War II, isn't it? Yeah, Hong Kong, um, I think, yeah. Yeah, and some people some people consider this as to be his best film. Yeah, yeah, I think it's... it's, it's I mean, it's epic, it's long, um, but it's... Uh, it always just transforms me. And, and, you know, I, I like war stories that aren't the traditional type of war story. Yeah, and I think, for me, it might need a rewatch because... It's a long time, maybe it's over 10, 15 years, maybe since I watched it. So what was it, 87 it came out? So oh, I, I remember the big, it was a big deal when I was, but I was a child then, a young child, so I didn't care for that. Um, but I remember watching it maybe later on when I thought I was all cultured, thinking, oh, I should watch this, and thinking it's just long. Um, but enjoying aspects of it. But I think I need to give it a rewatch to, to critique it properly, really. How he goes from privilege to nothing, you know. Um, it, it it takes you on a journey. I think it's a, I think it's a very good film. One of my favourites. I don't think it made your uh, top fifteen, but I think I had it so high. <laughs> it, um, yeah, yeah. It came in. Yeah, but that's only as I say. It's the same. It's only because I haven't seen it for a long time. The same as um, I haven't seen the new West Side Story, so I can't rank that. I've just got to rank the ones I've seen. Yes, that's one of the ones that's going to happen. Oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll not, <laughs> not spoil it. <laughs> um, right, okay. Uh, number eight, we have Catch Me If You Can. Yeah. Um, which I think is it's a great, great film, Catch Me If You Can. And shows he can do this lighthearted. It, is it a comedy? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of a little comedic, but it's, uh, it's an amazing true story. Yeah, another true story. Yeah. But um, it is like hard. Oh, the cast is unbelievable. I think Hanks and DiCaprio are brilliant. It's just a story that you're going, wow, no way did this happen. <laughs> and, uh, but it's just done really well. And I don't think it gets the credit it deserves. No, it's no, it's often overlooked. Yeah, I think it's just a fantastic film that I love to watch. And it's so quotable as well. Yeah, it is. And there's this kind of wish fulfillment as well. You're watching, you say, no, there's no way somebody's done all this. But it has that wish fulfillment of like almost. You know, you want to step into this, you know, the way he's, he wants to become a doctor, so he pretends to be a doctor. <laughs> a pilot, when he gets on that seat that you get onto, it's like, if anything went wrong, you're going to be called on a flight. It's the bottle that that takes. It is, and uh, Christopher Walken, I think, is brilliant in that film. Yeah. Is playing his normal type, but there's, like, the more the film goes on and the more you begin to see him through it, his son's eyes as he grows up, you begin to realise actually he's quite a almost pathetic, tragic man, and um, even though he's built up, you know, as this, and it's an interesting way of looking at your parents that you know you idolise them as as a child, and then as you grow up and become more mature, you begin to see areas where they lack, and and mm. it's it's a fascinating father and son story, I think, in that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a film I really really enjoy. Yeah. Very good film. Very good. Um, okay, number seven. Um, one that you liked less last time you saw it, um, which is Minority Report. Yeah, so I remember watching Minority Report and thinking it was revolutionary. Um, you know, really good, really good concept. Um, and I watched it recently and just some of the special effects were just poor. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, um, and that's, you know, at the time, I thought, wow, this is amazing. So it was just, and I'm like, so you should be able to get beyond that, but sometimes I'm just a bit petty and can't. <laughs> but as a concept, as a film, as something different, as even ethical, the questions it asks ethically and morally, mm. uh, I think, yeah, I think it was good. I think the casting was solid. Um, it was kind of like a thriller, but as a sci-fi. and it's even So, yeah, I did like it. I just... Didn't like it as much as I did at the time, but I think that's totally understandable because at the time it was, you know, it was all like, wow, look at these effects. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very good film. It's um, 
as a hard sci-fi, it I think it was uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. It asks a lot of questions, but also even the sort like this, it's got those, it's got the you know those spiders that are coming looking for you when he's got when he's he's got his eyes covered over and and mm. it's got so many visual things in it that you just you just get you there and then and I think it's uh, I think it's a very clever film and uh, it keeps you going right to the end. And I remember first time I see it, I had no idea how it was going to end. Um, and that's always that's always a good thing. And uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed Minority Report. I thought it was a very good film. Um, yeah. Okay, number six, we have Saving Private Ryan. Um, you you had this one very high on your list, didn't you? Yeah, this is this is my favourite Spielberg film. Yeah, and this was number one for me. Just and not just, but from that opening scene again, mm. another one that we're talking about that's based on true events. Um, mm. That opening scene, I've cinematically, I've never seen a scene that I'm like is more memorable to me. Mm. And there's plenty of scenes that I love, but that opening scene of Saint Private Ryan when they land on the beach, mm. um, just brought home the absolute horror of that situation, yeah. the absolute fear that must have been going through those young lads um, at that moment. Even though they've been sold this thing, you've got to serve your country, stepping off that boat. What there's nothing I, that will come close that I can imagine me to doing that physically or mentally. Um, yeah. and it captures that side of it, it captures the physical side of it, just how much of a massacre and a slaughter it was. Um, and then as the story goes on, there's the human element to it that this poor woman has suffered so much loss mm. that within this massive machine and this massive mission, that they try and do something kind for this one woman. Mm. Um, and I say the cast is superb. Visually, it's outstanding. Um, and I, I just I just love it. And so many levels, bringing on the horrors of war, the good of humanity and these small acts, the difficulty, the story. It's just it's just beautifully told, told story that has just so many facets and elements to it that mm. I just love. It's such a raw film, isn't it? Oh, yeah. um, it really is. I remember when the first time I saw it, I was not prepared for that opening battle. I mean, it was the how indiscriminate the bullets were. Yeah, you know, and it just it really hit you home. You know, you have no idea. You could you could be as brave as you want. You have no idea when that bullet's going to hit. Yeah, and uh, it's just the sound as well. The sound on it, it's like you can hear all the bullets and the ricochets. Yeah. And, and when they were coming through the underwater as well, even underwater, yeah, you know, it, it was yeah, it was just one of the. I think it took a long time again past watching the beginning of that film. Yeah, um, nothing. I think I've I've seen nothing that captures the horrors of war quite like that. No, and there's other good war films. You know, I mean, recently there's been a few. Do you know what I mean? And often well, inspired by that opening. I yeah, think, yeah. Well. But they still don't for me. That taking that scene alone, even though the rest of the story I think is quality, taking that scene, it just doesn't come close to me going, right, that's it. You know, when we used to read in history, oh, all these young men slaughtered 18 to 21. And I've been to um, you know, I've been to France and seen some of the war graves and look at you look at the ages of them. Um and you see that been Normandy and all these places, and it, it kind of doesn't. But you go, I still can't quite grasp the severity of it until you watch that film. Mm. It doesn't fully, but then I'm going right. That must have been awful. Just bodies everywhere. Just mm -hmm. as soon as they step off, before they step off, in the water, stuck on top of each other, underneath bodies, the mm. noise, yeah. And it doesn't glorify it at all. I mean, no. you look at some film like, like Hacksaw Ridge, for example. That's that's it's gruesome, it's graphic. It maybe goes a little far sometimes, but it doesn't capture the horror the same way as Saving Private Ryan does. No. Um, yeah. yeah. So I just uh, say it's my favorite film. Favorite, yeah, yeah, it is. In terms of what I think is his best films. There's others that we'll discuss, no doubt, and there's different elements and maybe more. No, I don't know if they are high profile, but for me, if I had to choose one to celebrate and honour above the others, it would be Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Great film, great film. Number five, we have Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is by far the best of the Indiana Jones films. 
Yeah, by far. Agree. And is just one of those films where it's just so iconic and so many. I mean, it, 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 even rewatching it now, you think it's a film just full of good bits. <laughs> That's what it is. It's like somebody has just put all the good bits in one film. <laughs> And uh, it never stops being an enjoyable film. No. Um, even from the opening, you know, when we first meet um, Indiana Jones, that opening bit where he's... You, even if you've never seen anything about any of these films before, you know in those few moments, this guy's a hero. <laughs> you know, the way he's introduced, that opening scene is just... It's so good. It's so good. And it's been often... Um, imitated, but it's never been equaled. No, no that's fine. and we'll find out probably when I go see Uncharted. It still hasn't been equaled. <laughs> yeah, and then there's another film coming, isn't there? Yeah, there is. But even they've never been able to recapture. I don't think Raiders. I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Last Crusade, mainly because I hit, it hit me at the right age. Really, you know, really enjoyed it. Temple of Doom a bit less so. Um, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is just the worst. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, it's not yeah, yeah, it's just the worst. <laughs> um, it's, but nobody else has managed to create. The, the, even you look at all the films that have tried to be like this, can't equal it. No, and I think it, there's credit in that as well. No, to Spielberg, obviously, but to Harrison Ford mm-hmm. or for the casting, because you think it. The credit that I think lies now is that, so you choose Mark Hamill, and I went to difficult because I had different careers. Or, or even Daniel Radcliffe, for instance, that you call these people are in iconic roles. Mm-hmm. But with Harrison Ford, to both as iconic as each other, you get Han Solo and Indiana mm-hmm. Jones. It's he makes it's equally them believable. They're both equally iconic, equally believable, and it's not like oh, that's the guy who played. It's that's the guy who played both of them. Yeah, yeah, he's. I mean, he he's great. Um, but with with Raiders, what really gets me, and it, I don't think Spielberg's repeated Raiders in that sense, is it's so well shot. Mm. Like every shot, it, 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 it's like every shot's a painting. And you look at the other films, and I think that you look at um, Temple of Doom, you look at uh, Last Crusade. He doesn't capture that. I think with Raiders, Spielberg was out to prove. Because he's just come off the back of 1940, 1941, which was a big flop. It gone over budget, over time. And he was, it hard to think, Spielberg was, people were questioning whether he still had it. And so Raiders has him out to prove a point, And he doesn't just prove it. He goes above and beyond and goes, you know, I'm the best. Um, love Raiders of the Lost Ark. Great film. Great film. Okay, uh, next one. Number four, we have Schindler's List. Yeah. Um, um, this is number two for me. I think it's just, and I've talked about it before, it's probably the most powerful film I think I've ever watched. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's from everything. The subject matter, I think, is always going to be tough. But we again, like the war, we heard about it at school. And mm-hmm. It's difficult to grasp it. You'd heard of the horrors, you'd heard of the camps, you visited you know, concentration camps, and it's, it's to take the information in is easy. Yeah. And But to, to get the severity and the enormity of it is difficult. Schindler's List helped me with that. And the, one way I think it did it, as, as, horror, as harrowing and horrific as the whole thing was, there was a story of hope in there. One man who, reluctant or whatever it was initially, did some good. Do you know what I mean? And so that story, rather than just looking at it, that there was, um, you know, a, a bit of positivity, because otherwise it could just be crushing. Mm. Um, but the, the fact that it was shot in black and white, the scene with the girl, with the court, um, so many powerful moments in it, just image-wise, sim- symbolism, sound, Acting, I thought Liam Neeson does an incredible job. Um, mm. As I say, that at the end, not there's no celebration, but it 
on a whole, as a story, it kind of makes you ashamed to be human. Mm. But somehow there's a thread running through it that kind of restores your faith in humanity. It's such a complex thing. It's just such a powerful film that I think you should have to watch before you leave school. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it, I mean, it should be required watching. It's, um, it's a hard film to watch. Oh, you I never sit down and go, I fancy, I fancy shins of this this today. Yeah, I've watched it twice in my life and I don't think I'll watch it again. No, I've seen it a couple of times and every time. I mean, it's a film that just emotionally is hard to watch. And by the, I mean, you're in bits by the end of it. You know, yeah. it'll take a hard person not to be in bits by the end of that film. And when, yeah. when Oscar Schindler breaks down at the end and, yeah. and says, I could, I could have done more, I could have done more, I could have... Yeah. Dear me, every time. I mean, it's a, it's a hard, hard film to watch. And that's the reality of it. You know, you're going, one way you're going, oh, yeah, you've done well and he's great and people like him. But the severity of the situation, you know, six million Jews and he's going, I could have done more. And that's because it was, it was such a huge thing. Mm. It was such a massive, um, massive loss of life. Do you know what I mean? That he's saying I could have done more because he sees the severity of it. He sees, yeah, it's just so powerful and it's just so hard hitting. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that Spielberg is Jewish means he he gets it in a way absolutely. that I, I don't think another filmmaker would have done. No, absolutely. And I think, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just captures it and yeah, just there's so much to it and we could be here for hours just talking about the different aspects of it, but visually, I think ultimately it's harrowing. Yeah. And that's the testament I give to it because any film about that subject matter, any film about the Holocaust and you know Nazis killing the Jews should be harrowing. Yeah. And there's others that aren't, there's others that have tried and they've kind of captured a bit of it, but this um and even though you know that it doesn't come close to capturing the full horrors of it. Because it's just a, a film showing you a little bit that um, it gives you a someone on the outside who doesn't, I don't know, is trying to understand. It gives you a glimpse into it. Yeah, yeah, it does. Excellent film, excellent film. But one I probably won't watch very many more times. No. Uh, number three on a completely different, um, <laughs> a different note, we have E.T., E.T. 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 is, to me, genius. The whole film. The whole film. The way that... Uh, and again, something you don't even realise until somebody points it out to you. It's all filmed from that child's eye view. Yeah, Every yeah. adult's tall in it. Um, you only see them from the waist up, don't you? Yeah. Uh, the, the, rest down, the interaction between the kids feels so real. Um, and it just builds and builds the story up to the, that moment where they take off on the bikes. It's just like this such it's it's, it's had such this build up to it. And then it it's one of those films where at the end where this the 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 ship takes off and the music just bursts through like this crochet. It's like the whole film just goes like that and builds to this crescendo. There's no there's no dipping in that film, it just goes like that all the way through, right to the end, and just takes you emotionally with it the whole way, the whole way up. And it's such a moment at the end of that film that it, it's magical. Yeah, and I rewatched it last year, and I think the, I guess the biggest um, compliment I can pay to the film, or the biggest honor I can give it, is that when I watched it as a child, it transported me into this world of this alien and all the emotions about people chasing him and wanting to do stuff to him, to you know, and die and all of this. It did all of that, but as an adult, it did exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? As an adult watching it, I was a child again, mm-hmm. fully in that place, fully, you know, wanting to be Elliot's best friend, fully, yeah. you know, getting all of that, laughing at the places that kid, I was. Just, it just turned me into a kid again, and not in a weird, giggly way, but in a lost in the magic and wonder. And I think it was one of the first films, along with Star Wars and Superman, probably where the impact, and I wouldn't have been able to articulate this then, but the impact of the score really is apparent. Mm. 
Do you know what I mean? The, yeah. the music in there. Um, obviously, as you've come older, I've become more aware of it, but that theme tune, riding my bikes, a little BMX as a kid, I always was wondering, will it take off? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Hoping that yeah. I'd take off if I pedal a bit faster. Um, but yeah, it's just, it is, I think magical is probably the word. It just transports you somewhere else. Um, the bit at the beginning where no one says out, oh, I think it was one of our first guests, the, the chap we used to work with. Oh yeah, Simon, yeah. Simon had pointed out that no one says out for the first however many minutes of the film. It's just torches and different noises and this, you know, E.T. fumbling around in a forest. But it's a, there's a tension. Hmm. There's a whole, oh, this is so it's just a, it's just a consuming, all consuming experience watching the ET. Yeah, it's great, and 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 some wonderful um, performances out of the child actors. Something Spielberg is really gifted at. Yeah, uh, all of them absolutely believable. Hmm. Okay, number two is Jurassic Park. Do you want to go first or second? No, no, you go first. Um, Jurassic Park is, I remember the first time I went to see Jurassic Park at the cinema. It absolutely blew my mind. I think, you know, it, there was a lot of hype about the dinosaurs and how good they'd look. Um, but I remember just sitting there, just absolutely believing 100% I was looking at real dinosaurs. Um the idea of the theme park and all of that, it just, it just captured my imagination in such a way. And uh, I found it, absolutely, I was sat there thinking, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I remember thinking that when I first, I mean, obviously it, it's, you know, <laughs> there's better things I've seen since, but I remember just sitting there, just absolutely blown away by it. And, uh, you know, talk about being transported in the, the again, I was transported to absolutely on this journey with these people. And I think it's one of those films I've probably seen it so often. And whilst I quite like some of the sequels, nothing captures what it's like to watch Jurassic Park. for the first. It's one of those films. I wish I could see it for the first time again. Yeah. I wish I could forget it so I could watch it again. Yeah. I think, yeah, for me, Jurassic Park is, and I think I've said this before, that for, as a cinematic experience, it's right up there. Mm. It's like, a, and I know most films are, but it's like a film that was created solely for the big screen. Yeah. Now, I've watched it on my telly and it's good, and, but a cinematic experience with the sound, again, with the score, with the whole thing, and this is what I was talking about at the beginning, the Spielberg has this talent. Um, this real talent to be able to put you in there. So mm. when that famous scene is with the water and it sh and it shakes, yeah. I don't just say I feel it. I felt it in the cinema, and you know it wasn't shaking, but I felt. I, I was like, oh yeah, he's coming mm -hmm. um, because of the sound and the imagery, and it just make it's like yeah, it's almost like I was in not virtual reality, but you know in four D cinemas. Yeah. It was almost like I was eight, way before I even knew what they were, that it was like. <laughs> and, and it does that so well. And I think the story's good. I think the theme park idea is genius mm. um, as a way of holding it all together. I know it was a book, but um, capturing that, yeah, I just, yeah, it's, it's a film that, that I enjoy. I've got a friend, Andy, who just loves them. Um, and I think I only really, really like the first one. Yeah. The rest yeah, are so. okay, but yeah. that first one is just head and shoulders above the rest of them. It shows such restraint as well. I mean, for the whole beginning of the film, you don't really get to see a dinosaur, not properly. You get glimpses no. here and there, snout or something, and then even when they start the tour, you get nothing, and you get nothing, and you get, you know, no shows. You get the T-Rex not showing up. And the first thing you see is that um, triceratops, that sick triceratops. And yeah. but it shows such a straight, and then that moment where the T Rex finally emerges is uh, oh, it's it's amazing, brilliant, brilliant moment. And, and, and uh, again, well, very well cast, I think. Yeah, yeah, very well cast, and uh, music again, another huge thing on that film. Um, love it, great film. So that leaves us with our number one, and there could only really be one number one when it comes to it's these films. Guess, isn't it? And that's Jaws. 
Um, Jaws is, uh, I think, will always be one of my favourite films ever. Yeah. I think for me, it, it's probably impacted my behaviour more than any other film ever. So <laughs> yes, you're still scared of the water, aren't you? Scared to go in the sea since the first moment, first time watching it. And, you know, I grew up in the North East, so it was a North Sea. There's not that many great white sharks in the North Sea, but I'm still scared. <laughs> um, in any sea that I've been around the world, to go more than uh, knee deep is brave for me. So it's usually halfway up my shin so I can see anything. And purely it started with this film and then it just became a thing, I think. Yeah, but yeah. And, uh, that's, again, but- that's a credit. It just terrorised me. Yeah, it, 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 it's genuine fear. I remember the first time watching it. I mean, it's it's not fear as in, you know, jump scares, although there's a couple of good jump scares in it. It's just this utter dread, isn't it? Every time someone's near the water. Um, and, of course, it has the guts to, very early on, a child dies. I mean, yeah. that is... Even when you're watching that as a child, that is the most horrific thing because the child always survives, you know. Yeah. Um, and it was just, yeah, good. and not just a good film in terms of the tension, in terms of the, I mean, the effects aren't great. The shark does not hold up and never held up, but it doesn't matter. No. It's just such a good story right through from, even this thing he has right from the start where, more than one person's talking at a time and it's been talked over and there's like so much going on and it's just, it feels so natural and feels so real. And you, you're, you're on the side of this police chief right from the start, right from the start. Yeah. And I think it speaks into, I was thinking about it the other day because it speaks into society today for me when there's this shark and this threat that is there mm. for the whole of the community mm. and they're worried about tourism and money mm-hmm. and what we're going to do, we need to play it down and there's a the whole thing with COVID now. There's the whole, whole argument. Do you know what I mean? Because it's balancing the finances of society, the economy against this threat. And, and it, it just came to my mind. I was like, it's a bit like Jaws when there was, they were arguing on question time, I think it was. Um, and, there, and I was like, yeah, it's a bit like Jaws. And so it, it doesn't shy away from that, you know, in looks at that. Um, and also... <laughs> it- Probably more than any other is what I said is that the, this is what I had in mind when I was saying that he has the ability to pick you up and put you in it. Mm. That on the beach at the beginning when he's listening to the radio, I think it's baseball or something, um, I feel how hot it is there. Yeah. I can smell the sun cream. I yeah. can hear the seagulls. I just And I can't, obviously can't because they're not all there, but that I'm right there. I'm like feeling a bit warm. and It just captures how hot it is, how... Fun it is that smell of sun cream. Yeah, the imagery is just it's just really good. And I feel like I've visited that place. I feel like I've lived in that place. Yeah, yeah. You do it do you feel like you know the place, don't you, by the end of the film? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was wondering, it must be every politician's dread to be compared to the Jaws mayor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would I, I don't know, I don't want to get too political, but yeah. <laughs> There's some similarity, isn't there? So. Yeah. Um and, and I love the fact that the film changes once they get on the boat as well. It becomes like yeah. a different film and it becomes yeah, it so claustrophobic. Um, but even the camaraderie, you know, they're not getting on, but they have that moment where they're all comparing scars and singing and then everything goes wrong. Oh, it's, yeah. It just takes you on that journey with um, Police Chief Brody, don't they? And, and, and yeah. the whole time you're just totally there with him. But even, yeah, and even a bit like you don't see the shark that much. No, no. Because of the barrels that are attached to him. The sight of barrels brings dread. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how just two yellow barrels can make you go, "Uh uh-oh. I'm not going to show you the shark. And then again, the music, the score, uh, it's so iconic. It it still scares me if we just hear the tune now. I'm still a bit like... Yeah, it's it's, it's such a simple little bit of music. That uh, is so so effective. Mm. It's uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and uh, I think it deserves to be at number one. Well, I obviously don't because I didn't put it at number <laughs> one. But if yeah. I if I put it at three and you put it at one, then there was a good chance it was going to be right up there. So. <laughs> there was. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've got no arguments with it. But it was number three for me. So yeah, um, on the basis of democracy, yeah, that is what we're ranking as the just talking about films 
number one Steven Spielberg film of all time. Yes, it, it does show the flaws in democracy, I suppose. <laughs> well, no, that's it. But we've decided that together, otherwise we'd just go with my point of view or your point of view. So yeah, that's good. The scoring system it worked out all right. So a couple of films that did not make the top 10, but just missed out. I won't do all of them, but we'll do the ones that just missed out. Number 11, we had West Side Story, um, which means I put that fairly high because you've not seen that. No. Um, but that's Spielberg proving once again, he can do anything. You want him to do a musical? He'll do it better than anybody else. <laughs> um, number 12 is The Colour Purple. Yeah, just another film where he's looked at something that's really you know, about the the human condition and the, the the evil that people can do to each other and, and filmed that and gone through an individual story or not even just individual, a, a community story through that. Um, it's a real, really powerful film again. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, number 13, we have War Horse. Yeah, again, story about a horse. At the, <laughs> No, but it is, but it's, it, there's so much, you know, wrapped up in that horse. Yeah. You know? oh, it, for me, I'd never understood. Uh, uh, maybe it was just my, 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 my lack. I'd never understood World War One, and how we got to this stage where we, we, we moved from everybody marching across a field at each other to the trenches. And this film really, for me, when, when there's that attack and, and the machine guns come out, changes war forever. You, you can't just sit on a horse and charge at people anymore. Yeah. And uh, I, I finally understood this, this the change that came in with World War I. Um, mm. I'd never clicked with it before, but I loved how you got to see um, people just living over the hill from where the battle was going on and how their life was just changed by it. You never think of that, do you? No. Um, so, uh, but yeah, another very emotive film, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think it's an underrated film and a better film than um, than perhaps it's been seen as. Yeah. Uh, number 14, we'll just go to 15. Uh, 14, War of the Worlds. Okay, yeah. So I haven't seen it, so I can't comment. Have you not seen War of the Worlds? I don't think so. The one with Tom I Cruise? I keep meaning and... to, and I don't know why I wouldn't have seen it, but I can't remember anything about it. So I've either watched it and it was that bad I can't remember anything about it or I've not seen it. <laughs> it's very good. It's got the opening attack of the uh, of the aliens. Obviously, it's very post 9-11, but it's, it's, it's so harrowing. And you really, I mean, again, you feel like you're there. You feel like you're going through that attack. It's very well done. Ends a little bit like, mm, okay. And there's a bit, it, it lulls a bit in the middle, but it's uh, it's got some strong moments in it. Worth a watch. Okay. Definitely worth a watch. Uh, Lincoln is number 15. Yeah, again, I love it. And so just even going through the list, one thing I think stands out for me is Spielberg, although Jaws was top, is he does true stories really well, mm. you know, and bio, biopics and he just historical stories um, and does them well, seemingly without a huge amount of controversy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so whether he just gets stories that not many people have heard of, like Saving Private Ryan, or um, that he just uh, does it, but he, he does it really well. And just it's one of the things that I thought before watching. This is going to be so boring. It's got another long runtime. Oh, what can it be? Abraham Lincoln, great. I'm not even American. I don't care. But yeah, just real, really good film. Just captures the man, the what he went through, his character. The agony of power, really. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's our honourable mentions. Um, what about you? What is your favourite Spielberg film? And did we not mention one of your favourites? Where, where, where did we miss? Which films have we missed out? Let us know. Well, Get in touch with mention... us on Twitter, on Facebook. We didn't even mention Hook, did we? No, Hook. Hook came down at number eighteen overall. Yeah, Hook, we didn't mention. Ready Player One, no, Bridge of 17. Spies. Yeah, there's, there's loads didn't make it on. I mean, that just shows how good Spielberg yeah. is. Well, yeah, get in touch. Let us know what you think about it, doing this impossible task. I mean, it doesn't matter what you think in terms of whether you agree with us. Well, still let us know, but this list is definitive. Me and Luke have done it. So this is the definitive list of the top 10 Spielberg films. Yes. As brought to you from just talking about films. Yes, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again next time.
See you then.